In his first feature, Anderson's use of Steadicam already exploits the dramatic qualities of cinematography, juxtaposing Sidney's dynamic movement against the other gamblers who are seated like zombies at their slots and screens. The camera whips to a side-angle view of Sidney, tracking him laterally. In doing so, it seems to pass through walls of ordinary gamblers. It then opens into a wider view of the floor, a panorama of light and sound, both realistic and expressive. No other shots are as flashy as this one in Heart 8, a fairly low-key drama led by a reserved, even inscrutable lead performance, but Anderson allows this one shot to give a glimpse into Sidney's subjective experience, the thrill of walking the casino floor. It's a precocious display of character development, achieved purely through camera movement and staging. The camera revels in this sensory landscape and simultaneously transcends it as Sidney advances to his rightful place at the head of the craps table. The celebrated opening shot of Boogie Nights hits you from the beginning with the bold appearance of the film's title, followed by a discombobulating tilt to the theater marquee. It tells us that we're in Reseda, in the heart of Southern California's porn country. But the floating sensation of this crane shot works less like a physical establishment of place and more like an out-of-body experience. Like the shot in Heart 8, the camera work owes a debt to Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas and Casino in the way it explores a historical milieu by moving through it. But a key difference is that Scorsese's camera asserts a documentary authenticity, primarily through an explanatory voiceover and a steady accrual of factual observations. Anderson discards these elements, plunging us directly into a state of sensory overload, washing us in a lurid palette of red and orange punctuated by neon. This three-minute shot introduces us to eight characters, perhaps more than we can keep track of, but the feeling is always pleasurable, like being at a party where you don't need to know everyone's names to enjoy their company. Anderson's camera is exultant, wanting to encompass everything and everyone at once. But if you look carefully, you'll notice that at every point, your vision is trained to focus on one particular character or area of activity, so that you're never overwhelmed or confused. It also employs lighting cues like this spotlight to train our attention to a character's arrival. For all its panoramic spectacle, this is still a linear viewing experience. The shot ends with a double climax, a collision of speed versus stasis, a lateral sweep across the dance floor, a joyous expression of Roller Girl's young body in motion, then slows to half speed to dote on Eddie Adams backlighting his youthful good looks like a discovery hidden in plain sight, waiting to burst upon the scene. This single two-minute, five-second shot encapsulates the essence of Anderson's three-hour magnum opus, connecting five different characters with the sheer velocity of forward motion through narrative space and time. Working with an unlimited budget and final cut, with this film, Anderson enjoyed a creative freedom afforded to the rarest of directors. But with that freedom came a great anxiety, one that pervades the film. Uh, where's Richard and really, Julia? Oh, good. Um, they're here. They're fine. They're in the dressing room. So we're all set. Okay. It's an anxiety to prove himself to do something even bigger than Boogie Nights, and it informs the hurried pacing of this particular shot as the camera moves faster than what we saw in the previous films. Fuck. We no longer have the sense of the camera expressing a character's emergence, as in Sydney or in celebrating a subculture, as in Boogie Nights. Here the shot amounts to a relay race between five characters organized in six different configurations. The shot's focal point is exchanged between them along a single line of movement. Ostensibly, this shot appears to reveal the workings of a Hollywood television studio, but it doesn't settle long enough on anything in particular to let you take in the details 
other than the anxious sensation of people working and moving. If there are any potential areas of interest on the periphery, they pass fleetingly. So what do you do? Whatever's happening, that's what you look into? Or something like that? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know, huh? Well, it's not a bad way to be. Interested in everything that's going around. It's a shot that wants to be everywhere at once and nowhere in particular. The attraction is in the camera movement itself as a spectacle of kinetic exertion, movement for the sake of movement. Hope you can make it. Remember when Barry used to get all mad? Oh my God. Ron used to call him gay boy all the time. With Punch Drunk Love, Anderson moves away from ensemble filmmaking in favor of a single character study. But ironically, the simpler premise allows his tracking shots to discover more complex applications. Instead of having his camera race frenetically, it tracks slowly in an ominous forward push, practically nudging Barry unwittingly through the gauntlet of his sisters as they heap casual abuse upon him. Remember, you'd be fine, and then we'd call you gay boy, you just freak out. Unlike the shots from the previous films, the protagonist is no longer held in the center, but pushed to the sides of the frame. The slowness of the tracking movement allows us to not only follow him, but also his sisters as they move around and against him. It also allows Anderson to utilize the space around the shot. Notice how one sister calls from off screen in one direction, yes. as another sister creeps in from the other direction. This kind of lateral push and pull creates a counter movement to the tracking shot's forward movement, a multi-directional tension that's new to Anderson's repertoire. It's even more prominent in this forward tracking shot. Here we really see Barry's frustration of being pulled left and right throughout the film while all he wants to do is go forward. It's as if Anderson is using Barry as an on-screen surrogate to challenge and complicate his own forward moving impulses. This two and a half minute shot is one of the longest in There Will Be Blood, yet it only moves several feet. Mr. Plainview? Yes. But within those few feet, it is able to create four distinct compositions. A profile close-up of Eli Sunday entering Daniel Plainview's office, an obstructed wide shot of Plainview at his desk, a medium three shot of Plainview, Sunday, and Fletcher, and a final close-up of Sunday. Each of these shifts changes the dramatic tenor of the scene and the dynamic between its characters, exploring and expositing the space between them. One way that it does so is providing multiple, steady points of focus for the viewer. What are you doing in Signal Hill? We have oil and it seeps through the ground. As demonstrated in this scientific study by the Dynamic Images and Eye Movement Project that tracks the eye movements of several viewers to see what they are looking at in the frame. It's in California? Maybe. I must land they buy. I'd like it better if you didn't think I was stupid. This steady multiplicity of focal points is something radically different from Anderson's earlier films, where one dominant point of focus leads our eyes through the shot. This camera work may not look as flashy as those of his earlier films, but the dynamism is there, compressed in slowness, steadily building dramatic tension, pushing towards release.